designed to be a battlefield game changer. The Gatling gun's greatest impact is in the skies. On helicopters. Jet fighters. And ground attack planes. With a 150-year reputation for causing mayhem, this legendary weapon has blown away a path to be the fiercest gun of all time. This is the Aerial Gatling Gun! A weapon that changed the world! Firepower. Nothing shaped military capability more. I'm Will Willis, former Army Ranger and Air Force Pararescuement. I've trained with modern weapons until firing them is second nature. Now I'm teaming up with leading experts to examine the greatest military firearms of all time and discover how these weapons change the world. It has a higher rate of fire than any military machine gun in the world. Commonly known as the Gatling gun, this blast from the past is back on the front line, delivering massive firepower against armored vehicles, buildings, and planes. Although first developed in the 19th century, the basic concepts for this weapon haven't changed. Today's Gatling guns come in many sizes and numbers of barrels. But all Gatlings have multiple barrels that revolve and fire sequentially. This allows extremely high rates of fire without causing the barrels to overheat and malfunction, a problem with regular single barrel machine guns. The technology has proven so effective, the Gatling gun has been modified to provide firepower in a wide variety of aerial platforms, including a light version, the GAU-19, developed for use in the air on the sea and on land. First manufactured by General Electric in 1983, the GAU-19 delivers up to 2,000 rounds a minute. Paul Snyder is part of the team that tested the newest model of this three-barreled Gatling. The GAU-19 has got to be one of the most reliable crew serve weapons out there today. You can fire this weapon 35,000 rounds before you even have to worry about the first maintenance cycle. You know when you squeeze the trigger, you can neutralize the threat no matter what the threat. That thing is nasty. That it is, Will. So we've got the GAU 19B, is that what that is? The GAU 19B is less than a year old. There was an immediate need in Afghanistan for a lightweight weapon to go on to Kiowa, the OH-58D. In less than a year, we turned around an A model to a B model, started delivering those weapons. They're in route today. What's the difference between the A model and the B model? Weight, lost 30 pounds, and it comes with a battery pack. The coolest thing about that is you can lose vehicle power, helicopter power, and still be able to engage and shoot targets for 2,500 more rounds. And that's critical in, in any kind of situation. Absolutely. And why don't you tell me a little bit about how it operates? What we're firing here is 1,300 shots a minute. We found that's the sweet spot for crew serve weapons. And it's also good for rotary wing aircraft. You can engage a target, you get enough rounds off, and you still have plenty to come back and make another pass. And it's 50 caliber. 50 caliber, same round, same length as your Ma Deuce and any other 50 caliber weapon out there right now. From this platform, a Humvee, you've got a machine gun that fires 1,300 rounds a minute. What types of targets are you engaging? What you're trying to neutralize, say you're on patrol. You luck up into the canyon, and here comes a light armor vehicle coming down the road. You need to neutralize that target as quick as possible, and a 50 cal allows you to do that. Right. The purpose of the 50 cal is to penetrate engine blocks or light armor. Well, I can't wait to try it. Well, let's do it. OK. Let's do it. I'm ready. OK, so where's my target? 
All right, about 400 meters out in front of the weapon. Okay. We have a minivan that's going to represent your light armor incoming threat. So there's the minivan in my sights, both eyes open. I mean, that's a great sight picture. That's unbelievable, isn't it? It's holographic. All you got to do is put that red dot on, squeeze the trigger, and watch the target go away. Yeah, it's very cool. Now, did you know that statistically minivans are the most dangerous car on the road? I think that's why we should neutralize that target today. It's a public service. All right, so switching the weapon to fire. Got it. Good job, Will. That'll do. Way to go, buddy. I think that uh, it's a great beaten zone weapon. I think that uh, it's easy to walk rounds into place. I mean, obviously, having it mounted to a platform like this, once again, you don't have to carry any of that weight. It's easy to manipulate and maneuver your rounds into exactly the location you want them to be. Yeah. It's definitely, definitely a powerful piece of equipment. I can see how on the ground this would exponentially increase a unit's capability and combat effectiveness. So, I mean, it's it's badass. <laughs> Way to go, man. Way to Appreciate go. Appreciate it. The Gao 19 is a powerful blaster. But it pales in comparison to the largest Gatling gun on the planet. This is davis Monthan Air Force Base, home to the 12th Air Force's 355th Fighter Wing, where they fly a plane that's unique in today's aviation world. This beast is officially called the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Its pilots call it the Warthog, while its enemies call it the Monster. Ugly, tough, and vicious, just like its namesake, the Warthog is the only plane in the United States Air Force inventory that is specifically designed to fulfill the close air support role. And because of that, it is literally built around one of the most powerful cannons ever mounted in an aircraft, the GAO-8 Avenger. First entering service in 1977, the Warthog's GAO-8 Avenger is one of the most feared weapons in the world capable of firing more than 4,000 rounds a minute. The Avenger earns its stripes in 1991 during the first Gulf War. In Operation Desert Storm, the Warthog uses the GAO-8 to destroy more than 900 Russian-made Iraqi tanks. In one of its primary roles as a tank killer, the A-10 has the ability to fire 30 millimeter rounds of different types. Some of them are high explosive incendiary rounds that are basically like grenades when they hit the ground. Others are depleted uranium that are 1.7 times denser than lead and have the ability to penetrate five inches of armor at a range of 500 meters. The GAO-8 30 millimeter Avenger cannon all by itself weighs 619 pounds. Throw in 1,174 rounds of ammunition, the drum, and the feed mechanism. Now it's over 4,000 pounds and in excess of 19 feet long. A weapons maintenance team inspects and services the Avenger before each flight. Then they precisely position it back into the plane. The maintenance team for this plane is overseen by Tech Sergeant Tarand Gallant. From mechanism to barrel, what are we looking at piece by piece here? Here we have the feed side. The rounds actually feed in, go through, rotate through. They fire on the other side. Uh, they come out the barrels, as you know. Two clamps here. You got the muzzle clamp and the mid-barrel support. And that's just to keep it compressed so that it doesn't spread. Because it turns so fast, the barrels can actually spread. Really? Uh, from all that power generated. That's why it's set up the way it is. 
Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. To find out what it's like to fly and fire this multi-million dollar weapon system, I've enlisted the aid of Major James Collier. His call sign is Beer Can. It is a thrill to fly the airplane, and what I really like about flying the A-10 is when I go to the range, I fire the gun. You don't really feel the recoil from the gun. All you feel is the vibration. And you see the gun gas going over the, the canopy. About one to two seconds later, you see the impacts of the bullets on the target. What is it like to sit in the cockpit of this thing? Well, you're sitting on top of a 30 millimeter, seven barrel, 15 and a half foot gallon gun that shoots 3,900 rounds a minute. So it's instant feedback whenever you fire the weapon. All you have to do is put the pipper on the target and squeeze the trigger if the system is fully functional. Put the thing on the thing and eliminate the thing. That's right. <laughs> All right. I see it, I point at it, and I shoot it. To see the full power of the GAO-8 Avenger, we've come to a range in the middle of the Arizona desert, and we've set up some cameras on two different targets. One is a conventional APC target. The other one is an 18-foot-wide strafe target. Major John Collier is going to be coming in and unleashing the full power of that 30 millimeter Gatling gun. Now, that GAO-8 is going to rip this target to shreds, and I don't want to be standing here when that happens. Here we go. He's coming in now. So this A-10 is coming in at a very steep angle, about 60 degrees, and he's taking a dive approach on the target. And what the dive approach helps this guy do is punch through the armor on the top of the APC in order to get through that thick skin more effectively. He's got that steep angle. Here we go. There he goes. Oh, you can see the target. So with the altitude that he's flying at, you hear the rounds impact the target before you hear the rounds actually fired from the gun. The cool thing about this is that you see all that exhaust from that gun just kicked out of the side of the aircraft as soon as he fires. But when that happens, it's already too late. He's locked on target, he's engaging, and whatever he's locked onto isn't going to be there anymore after all the debris has stopped falling. Here comes another one. He's coming in now. Guns, guns, guns. Impact on the target. And the shots from the sky. How cool is that? Awesome. Today, you can find Gatling guns throughout the arsenal of the United States Air Force. And they all spring from a weapon that made its debut in the Civil War. All of the multi-barreled guns used in the United States Air Force today can trace their history back to a single weapon system invented over 150 years ago, the Gatling gun. The groundbreaking weapon is named for its American inventor, Dr. Richard J. Gatling. Creating the gun shortly after the outbreak of the U.S. Civil War, Gatling's goal is to make a weapon so powerful it can bring an end to large-scale combat. It's an incredible advance over the single-shot, muzzle-loading weapons in use at the time. The multi-barrel Gatling gun is manually operated by a hand crank. If the gunner can turn the crank fast enough, the gun can fire 200 rounds per minute. Though the first Gatlings have enormous potential, technical problems limit its use in war. And at 800 pounds, it's still too heavy to be moved around easily. By the late 1800s, however, most of these problems have been solved, and the Gatling gun begins having an impact on the battlefield. The secret to the Gatling gun is its multi-barrel design. A hand crank rotates the barrels, and as each one reaches the top of the weapon, it's loaded by a gravity-fed hopper. 
Each barrel has its own bolt and firing pin that fires the bullet as it rotates past an automatic trigger. As the barrel continues to spin, the spent cartridge is ejected and a new bullet is loaded from above, starting the process all over again. I've come to Pennsylvania to fire a real piece of history. This particular Gatling saw real action in one of the most heralded moments of the Spanish-American War, when the U.S. fought for control of Cuba and other Spanish colonies. The Battle of San Juan Hill marks the arrival of a new world power. Yet, as it starts, American forces are being outshot by Spanish troops firing from entrenched positions at the top of the hill. Teddy Roosevelt prepares to lead his personally recruited unit, the Rough Riders, in a charge up the hill, a suicidal mission without fire support. That's when a detachment of Gatling guns moves into position on a nearby hill. The Gatlings open a steady and deadly fire on the Spanish troops. With fire support from the Gatling guns, Roosevelt and his Rough Riders make their successful charge up San Juan Hill. Today, one of the original Gatlings that saw action in the war is owned and kept in mint firing condition by Dr. Ed Weitzman. It's the ultimate to me, the ultimate development of antique weapons. This particular Gatling gun has a unique history, is that correct? This, this gun actually was one of four guns used by Lieutenant Parker, who was with the invasion of Cuba. He attached himself to Roosevelt's Rough Riders, figuring that he could do more damage with the Gatling gun with the infantry up front rather than leaving it with the artillery in the rear. Originally, the Gatling gun was viewed as a defensive weapon, not an offensive weapon. That's correct. Okay. They were put back with the artillery. And Lieutenant Parker revolutionized the way that these were employed. Exactly. He was the first one to use a machine gun in the offensive role. This is a really exciting piece, and uh, I want to ask your permission to please fire your weapon that was at San Juan Hill. As long as you don't shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> this is a long stretch. <laughs> yeah, I promise. We've set up a variety of targets to measure the performance of this 1895 10-barrel Gatling gun. Seven milk jugs and four bottles will test the Gatling's mobility to traverse and elevate as it would have done at San Juan Hill. Then I'll need to sweep five watermelons with the force of the Gatling's big 50 caliber round. Finally, silhouettes with 13 reactive discs will reveal the Gatling's accuracy at 100 yards. That's 55 targets, and I have 200 rounds to fire. Let's see how fast we can get this done. Sure, plugs in? Yes, sir. Let's fire it. Woo, hot brass, I'm a nuts. Reloading. We got one, two, three, four targets down. A little hiccup at the start, but this gun is surprisingly accurate. Now the tricky part. While Ed reloads, I have to adjust my position so I can traverse the gun and fire at the same time. All right, coming up. Elevating the line of fire is proving to be much harder, a clear limitation in the design. Coming down for the watermelons. Still, I'm making great time with the targets until the gun jams. It's jammed up. What do you have to do to unjam this? OK, just pop the feed tray. Dr. Weitzman has obviously done this before, but I'm helpless and a bit worried. That's got to be hot. Now we're back up and ready. <laughs> I didn't break it, did I? I mean, this is a priceless piece of history. It's a little just mirror, see? Just looking for daylight. All right. He whips out this tiny mirror to look down the barrel making sure there are no rounds blocking any of the tin. Because if I send another round down one that's blocked, we're in trouble. We're all clear. The blockages really hurt my time. I'm just glad I'm not facing a charging enemy. Looks like we're all clear. All clear? All righty. 
That is exciting stuff. Nice All job. Right, thank you. It was really accurate. You know, my first round that went down hit that first milk jug, and I was able to traverse very easily across. Just cranking that wheel has had nice, smooth action. You know, adjusting for elevation was a little bit more difficult. One of the things that I noticed was that I was I started out here on what I thought was the seat of this gun, and it was really awkward because my body was bent like this, but when we started shooting, drop some of that brass. Just drop it right there. It, it's all sliding down, and I've and got hot, hot brass and in hot. my crotch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that made me jump up like this. But then I sat behind this thing, my sights lined up, and all the brass that was coming out of the bottom of the weapon was being deflected right here. And there's a hole right here. So anything that got around this went into that hole just like that. So but through use, I think I discovered this is actually uh, a brass deflector, I so would, to speak. I would tend to agree with you. I usually stand up and leave it down. <laughs> I gotcha. For a gun used over 100 years ago at San Juan Hill, it's pretty freaking impressive. In two minutes, I shot 23 out of 55 targets. And look at these hits on the discs. There's shots on the head, the chest, and you can see that these rounds are just impacting all around, you know, three, four rounds in the head here. I mean, good center mass shots up in these areas. This guy was just riddled with holes. I mean, he, there must be 50 holes in here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it's you letting me come here. I, I, I appreciate you letting me shoot that antique. I mean, an amazing piece of American history from the Spanish-American War. I mean, unbelievable. Despite success, such as the one at San Juan Hill, the Gatling gun is eventually made obsolete by the Maxim machine gun. Lighter, faster firing, and longer range than the Gatling gun, the Maxim is superior in every way and it enables machine guns to become the battlefield weapon of choice. Then, with the advent of super speed jet fighters around World War II, a new aerial gun is needed that can fire thousands of rounds per minute to shoot them down. The Gatling gun was doomed to the scrap heap by the machine gun, but the Gatling gun has made a remarkable comeback. During the 1950s, General Electric uses the old concept of the Gatling gun to design a new electrically powered Gatling, the Vulcan. This F-16 is armed with the first of the modern Gatling guns, the M-61 Vulcan Cannon. It's a 20 millimeter Gatling gun that's capable of firing over 6,000 rounds a minute. The M-61 Vulcan has been the main cannon armament on all US combat fighters for 50 years. I want to go for a ride. First, I need to get fitted for my flight suit. What happens is if you're in a hard bank and the force of gravity is amplified, it's going to shunt blood you know, out of the core of your body. And you're not able to oxygenate your brain, you're going you're gonna to pass out. What this G-suit does is it assists with squeezing the blood from the legs into the core. The pilot's going to be in the front, you're going to be in the back. Now that I'm suited up, I get a quick training session on the F-16 simulator. They hand you two of these motion sickness bags, appropriately labeled, OK? You're supposed to get in here with gloved fingers and somehow pull this thing out prior to puking, blow chowder in it, and then get it into your take-home freezer bag. That's the joke. I've seen the awesome power of the M61 Vulcan Gatling gun from the ground, but now's my opportunity to see it from the air in the back seat of that F-16 two-seater. Piloting the F-16 is Major Dave Solomon. His call sign, Scrappy. So in just the shortest sense, what are we doing today? The short sense, we're going to go practice uh, dropping Bob, and of course, we're going to shoot the Vulcan gun. Two passes. 250 rounds total. I can't wait to see it in action from that canopy. Yeah, that'll be right. awesome. Let's do it. Believe it or not, I've waited my whole life to go on a jet wreck. Yeah, man, you'll, you'll enjoy it. I'm just hoping I don't shit my pants. <laughs> I hope so, too. Cuddling, cuddling, uh, Scrappy going out with Will in the backseat on chaos number three. Two pink jet going down to uh, range two. 
We're going to go and do a quick G warm up. So I'm going to do four to four to five Gs to the left, and then five to seven Gs to the right. All right? Okay. Hey, awesome G warm up. Ninety left. Go. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome, man. And you can really feel that. Yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> that now why people might get sick, man. We'll squeeze it right out of you. It will, won't it? <laughs> So as we're coming in on the gun runs, we saw our bird lead us in. We came in right behind it, and that angle is so fast and so steep that it really, I mean, you're moving. OK, I'll three, clear it off. Yeah, three. OK, here comes the gun, my friend. OK. And when that gun goes off, I was right next to it. I could see the smoke. I could feel the vibration of the gun. What you think, Will? Get one more pass. Here we go. Here we go. All right. And then we climb very quickly because if the if the pilot gets target fixated, he'll drive the nose of the F-16 right into the ground. Altitude. Full out. Full out. We climb very quickly, very fast. I can feel the suit squeezing on me. That's it. Two runs. That's it. We're empty, 250 rounds. Holy smokes, it goes so fast. And to be inside of that platform when that Gatling gun is rocking. That Vulcan, it really gets it. Man, that you did was a great awesome. job. Thank you. And that Vulcan cannon is amazing. Unbelievable. Two passes, 250 rounds, like that. Massive amounts of firepower coming out of that Gatling gun. Unbelievable. And actually flying with you was a dream come true for me. So yeah, well, thank you I had very a good much. time with you, man. And the bag is still it. empty. The bag is still empty. Nice. It's the mo nice. most important thing, you know, maintain my... I'm about to go puke. <laughs> The Vulcan proves the Gatling gun, once again, belongs on the front lines. But possibly the most famous modern Gatling is a compact model that first makes its mark in the Vietnam War. Known in the Army as the M134 and by the Air Force as the GAU-2, it fires a smaller 7.62 millimeter round, giving this Gatling the name Minigun. But there is nothing small about its impact in the field. As a former Air Force pararescue man, I know that success can depend on both the minigun and the insertion aircraft. This is the HH-60 Pavehawk. In the United States Air Force, the HH-60 is used primarily for combat search and rescue, which means that if an air crew or U.S. asset is ever stranded behind enemy lines and needs to be recovered, it's an HH-60 and its air crew that respond to that call. Now on board, the HH-60 has two GAU-2 miniguns. One is operated by an aerial gunner and the other by the flight engineer. But these things are badass. Technical Sergeant Chris Morford is a gunner with the 55th Rescue Squadron. I think the, the best thing about the minigun is reliability. You're putting out a lot of rounds in a, in a very short time, and it keeps going. So what is this GAU-2 minigun capable of? It can shoot a lot of rounds at a high rate of fire and basically keep the heads down of the bad guys. And the rate of fire is? We have uh, two triggers on there. It's 2,000 rounds per minute or 4,000 rounds per minute. I think I remember this. You press one trigger and it's kind of, you know, fast, but then you get into the other one and it's nuclear. Definitely, because we have six barrels and six bullets shooting through there. How important is this minigun when we start talking about combat search and rescue and providing close air support? It's phenomenal. We can reach up about 1,500 meters. We have that strength of going in there and being able to be our own weapons platform and taking care of the threat as another aircraft goes into the, the zone to pick up the threat. OK, so what you're saying is if one is landing to pick up casualties or assets, the other aircraft can fly in close air support. That's exactly right. We're basically our own wingman at that point in time. Uh, we don't need the A-10s. We don't need anybody else to help us out. We can go in there with a two ship. Suppress, get in, get out. Combat search and rescue teams go wherever they're needed. In this action, a U.S. Army soldier is wounded in a firefight. Within minutes, an aircraft carrying Air Force pararescue men is on the scene. The GAU-2 gunner lays down suppressive fire as the pararescue men swing into action. 
the wounded soldier is quickly loaded into a litter and hoisted aboard the hovering HH-60. The speed and skill of the pararescue team are instrumental in saving the wounded soldier's life. And the Pavehawk's miniguns allow them to move fast and save lives. Many of the miniguns used by today's combat helicopters, including the ones that I flew in as an Air Force pararescue man, are made right here at Dillon Arrow in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm not here to talk about how it's assembled, though. I'm here to put it through the ringer. Gunnery instructor Trey Hicks knows the Dillon minigun inside and out. My favorite thing about firing the gun is just watching the impacts. You know, I'm shooting 50 rounds a second, so you can't hardly miss. It's just a great gun. It's fast, easy to use gun. So, Trey, how does the Dillon minigun increase the combat capability of the aerial gunner? The Dillon increases the capability of the gunner by providing overwhelming firepower, something that's easily aimed, that's lightweight for power management, and something that's reliable and that will always shoot. The Dillon is most often compared to the Maud Deuce. Right. Now, the Maud Deuce is a proven weapon system. It's been around for over 90 years. It's reliable. How do you compare the minigun to the M2? Those are all true statements. It's a great gun. The minigun provides a lot more shot density. There's no movement in this gun. It's like aiming a laser pen at something. Where the Maw Deuce, because it's recoil operated, there's a lot of movement between each right. shot. It takes a little bit longer to get on target. Now, the spec sheets say that this thing fires 4,000 rounds a minute. What kind of target requires that heavy volume of fire? Any target, you know? <laughs> the great thing about it is I'm, I may be shooting three or 4,000 rounds a minute, but I can control that with burst length. So I can do as short a burst as I want and put out 50 rounds, 100 rounds, or I can suppress a whole hillside, you know, by doing 20 seconds of fire. We're gonna have to test that out, so we'll head out to the range. Let's do it. All right, so our first test is going to compare the long range accuracy of the M2 versus the 134. Now, since you're the minigun expert, obviously you're going to fire the 134. Is that good? Yeah. A continuous five second burst will emphasize the difference in recoil and its effect of staying on target between the M2 and the minigun. We have a single barrel about a thousand yards away. I'm going to unleash a five second burst on that target with the M2. We'll see how many rounds hit the target, and then you'll follow up with a five-second burst of your own. We're shooting at the same barrel, a man-sized target. We'll see which rounds hit the barrel based on the size of their bullet holes. The M2's 50 caliber round is nearly 60% larger. I should get out about how many rounds, think? About 50 rounds. And you're going to kick out what? 250. So you got better odds than me. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Weapon's hot. Y'all good? Good to go. <laughs> After a second, I couldn't even see what was going on. I couldn't see my target up front, and the gun just started this rhythmic jump up and down because of the recoil of the weapon system. So basically, what I have is a beaten zone. It's going to be very long. As far as routes on target, I don't think it's going to be that good. Now it's Trey's turn with the minigun. All right, iron. With my weapon, there was a lot of that up and down, the change in elevation because it's bolt action. Right. You know, and uh, it was, I mean, my beaten stone, I can tell, is a lot looser than yours. I mean, it looks like you were all over that target. Yeah. yeah, you know, it was obscured from the tracer and some of the smoke, and I just kind of walked around the area where I thought the target was. Yeah. We'll have to go check it out and see what kind of hits we got. I think you're all over it. All right, we'll see. Right now, we're going to head down. We're going to check out our targets. I'm not feeling too good about my accuracy overall. But that minigun, the 
because it's not recoil operated, he was on point with it the whole time. We've got one, two, three, three solid hits and then some frags. Even though my M2 jumped all over the place, I still got three rounds on the target. But the minigun, because of its shot volume and lack of recoil, just peppered the target with 15 hits. Well, look at this keyhole, that's great. We've got a lot, plenty of hits on the back side. Couple down here. This is a point size target. It's a man sized target at 1,000 yards. I mean, it's high expectations for any weapon system. Sure. Uh, unless, especially non scoped weapon system. So, uh, I mean, but it does get the point across that. You know, your minigun is a lot more controllable than that 50 cal in the same configuration. You're spitting out, what, five times the rate of fire. So it's all good. Right. And you know, that was uh, that was one burst. Yeah. There's 3,000 more rounds where that came from. In the next test, it's my turn to try out the minigun and see who's faster and more accurate at taking out multiple targets. All right, Trey, this next set of targets is about 75 meters away, so a lot closer. We're looking at three man-sized targets and two barrel targets apiece. You're going to be the X's. I'm going to be the O's. You're going to be on the M2. I'm going to be on the minigun. Take out the barrels last. It's a race. All right. All right, tic-tac, oh, no. Ready? Let's do it. All right. Three, two. One, go! These monsters are kicking up so much dust, it's hard to see my targets. Firing 4,000 rounds a minute, I have a real advantage and take out all my O's and barrels first. <laughs> I saw one. I saw one. <laughs> all right. Woo! Nice shooting. Yeah, that was great, man. You know, I didn't even have to use the sights when I was right here. All I did was look at the impact of the rounds. I walked them onto the target where they needed to be, let the dust settle a little bit, just to identify whether or not those targets went down. I took out my barrels. I took out Trey's barrels. I took out my barrels again. I did some crazy fire across the top. Came across these other barrels. It was awesome. This is badass. And I can tell from here that this barrel is just shredded. When you get up close and personal with this thing, it is dangerous. It's on point, and oh my god, it's impressive. Look at this, you can't even count. You can't even count the number of holes in this barrel right here. Look at that, that is just so locked on and tight. So while the M2's larger 50 cal round packs more destructive power, the minigun's increased rate of fire and lack of recoil allows more hits on target. I'm tracking the evolution of the Gatling gun from its early hand-cranked model to the formidable weapons used on today's battlefield. The M61 Vulcan, a six-barrel, 20-millimeter metal shredder that can fire up to 6,600 rounds per minute. It's so deadly and reliable that it's armed all U.S. Air Force fighters for over half a century. The GAO 19B, a three-barreled blaster that fires the same lethal 50 caliber ammo as the famous M2 heavy machine gun. But at up to 2,000 rounds per minute, that's more than twice the rate of the M2. and the Gow 8 Avenger, mounted on the A-10 Warthog. 
a fire-spitting dragon, it can take out the most heavily armored vehicles in the world. Another Gatling currently being used is the one I'm a little more familiar with, the blistering high-tech minigun. I'm ready to take to the skies and put the Dylan minigun to the ultimate test. Tech Sergeant Trey Hicks is here showing me how to effectively use it at a distance and against multiple targets. The Dillon Arrow minigun is the most versatile and among the most deadly of the modern Gatling guns. And to show just what kind of mayhem you can unleash with this little monster, we've devised a special final challenge. What do we got? All right, in this scenario, we've got uh, a few vehicles suspected of planting IEDs in our area. They look like 55-gallon drums. So we're going to fly by, look for the IEDs, and then we're going to shoot them. If they go off, we know that they were definitely bombs. All right, sounds great. You ready? Yeah. Let's do it. All right. Our goal in this final test is to first destroy the IEDs and then take out the vehicles. We have four passes and 6,000 rounds to get it done. Okay, we've spotted our convoy, but on the first pass, Trey's gonna take out these barrels that are filled with explosives. We're gonna come back around and I'm gonna take out the cars. Time to see how accurately the Dillon gun can strike small targets from a moving aerial platform. Every fifth round Trey fires has an incendiary charge called a tracer. This allows a gunner to see the projectile, helping to zero in on the target. Gun is safe. Nice! So Trey's taking out all the barrels! It's time for me to get on those cars! Good job! Yeah, this would be a gunner change. He's gonna smoke the cars. Don't worry about the barrels, really focus on those cars. You got it. spitting out of the minigun, it makes it easy to hit the cars even on the move. That was awesome! Let's go back around and hit him again! On this one, let's do it a little higher than the normal pass. This one, you really you should, we should see the trays are really burning on this one. On this next flight pass, the pilot increases the height and distances from the targets to test my abilities as an aerial minigunner. The tracer rounds help me stay on target. Good, nice first line. That's good. Let's do a high speed line straight. On this next pass, our approach is fast and low. This minimizes our exposure to an enemy, but increases the difficulty of hitting the target. So these things are going to go by fast and so just get on one, then go to the next one, get on. It shows that that gun can move really fast from one target to the next. Flying at 100 miles an hour, but I still nailed them. Finally, we're going to bring the helicopter in sideways and do a center pass, firing down directly over the targets to finish them off. This shows the versatility of the helicopter 
working in tandem with the minigun. At this point, you can shoot fucking everything on that rope. experience I've had in a really long time. I fire a lot of guns. This thing is pure adrenaline. Woo! I've flown on helos before and operated the minigun, but not that many rounds and not in that sort of volume. and hit these targets one after the other after the other to see them explode, see them ignite. It's unbelievable. We've seen how the Gatling gun has been completely transformed from the hand-cranked original to the rapid-fire descendants that can take out everything from enemy personnel to the heaviest armored vehicles in the world. The versatility of that weapon, combined with the versatility of the aircraft, really do make it a weapon that's changed the world. I'm Will Willis, locked and cleared. I'll see you next time on The Range.